Ah, yes, the key of the jungle. Red Bull. Red Bull? Red Bull? So you'll never be faster than a lion. I don't have to be quicker than the lion. Just faster than you. Praise the Lord, saints. This is Pastor Parson coming to you again for another wonderful Sunday morning, another beautiful time of worship. We're so thankful for the goodness of the Lord and all that he continued to do for us. We thank God for you being a blessing to this ministry as well as to our lives. Thank God for our devotional leaders and all of those who work in the background to make sure that these messages can come to you each and every week. We want to say we thank God for you. Uh, we celebrate you in such a mighty way and in such a tremendous way. And just all of you that continue to bless us and make sure that these uh, messages are possible and these services, our Sunday schools, uh, our learning academy, which is so important and a vital part of this ministry for our teachers, our superintendents. Uh, we're so grateful and we thank God for all of you and all of your support. At this time, we're going to open up with a word of prayer and get right into today's message. All wise and eternal God, our Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we once again, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We praise you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Father, now I ask you to bless this word and make us a blessing. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, saints, we're presently in a series uh, at this time, a salvation that can withstand temptation. And I'll pick up from last week where we talked about staying in the light, even when it's too dark to see. And we was coming from first Peter, the fifth chapter. And we're going to pick up at verse eight on today. And it reads, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. All right. Today, I want to speak to you from the title. Stay sober and alert. It's getting too dark to see. Stay sober and alert. It is getting too dark to see. On last week, I highlighted when Apostle Peter spoke of the mighty hand of God uh, or the powerful power of God. Not this power that says I have the Holy Ghost and I speak in tongues, but yet I have no power to get up and be all that God called me to be. Neither is his power that only works at the church and only in a praise break. But when it comes down to facing the reality of trials, persecutions, our death, and even grief, suddenly it stops working for us. No, God's power is his mighty hand or powerful power. Not this, I have the Holy Ghost. But when it comes to putting my life on the line to demonstrate the powerful power of God, I back down and put the will of God second, third, and be and not be what Jesus called me to be so that others can see what the powerful power of God is like in action and what it's all about. You see, it's one thing to have the Holy Spirit, but you notice Acts 1 and 8 says, after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you should have power. That means that you have to allow the Holy Ghost to have you. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to have us, to take control of us, we have powerful power at work in our lives. A salvation that can withstand any and all temptations. Yes, even the temptations of our day. You see, it's one thing for you to have the Holy Ghost, but when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and has you, that's when your power is powerful. And all the years that I've been in church and in ministry, I've learned that pragmatically there is power and then there is powerful power when it comes to the things of God. It's not this power that works only when I can see my way, but when it's too dark for me to see. 
I feel hopeless and when I feel helpless and powerless and I'm moping around like I've been beat up and beat down. Listen, saints, God's power, when it comes upon you and you come under the mighty hand of God, God's power becomes powerful power and can withstand anything that is thrown at our salvation, including the temptations that come upon us. But one thing for sure, we not only have power that works in the church building, or, uh, but we have power that works in any situation that we find ourselves succumbing to. God's power is, is powerful power. But we must stay in the light even when it's too dark for us to see. That brings me to today's message. Stay sober and alert. It's getting too dark to see. The devil, our adversary, like a roaring lion, is prowling about, seeking for someone whom he can devour. Now, understand, saints, the devil was defeated by Jesus at Calvary, but he is not depleted of his character and ability to be a devil. He is still our adversary, and he is much angrier now than he was before being defeated by Jesus at Calvary. However, this is the day of salvation where our strength and the kingdom of God is prevailing and advancing. And on this side of the cross, not even the gates of hell or death itself can prevail against the church of God. Now, during this time of salvation, believers are the Lord's witnesses. And however, the devil is still after the believer. Now, we can think of it like this. In the judicial system, sometimes for a while, have to be put under the witness protection because they have the power to identify and testify against a criminal that is facing trial. In the case of a notorious criminal, he or she does not stop pursuing the eyewitness after the trial is over, even when they're convicted and found guilty. The trial of the devil is over. He has been sentenced. He has been found guilty. He has been sentenced to the lake of fire. He knows that he has only a short time before being cast into the lake of fire to serve out his sentence for eternity. This day of salvation is his aggravation because it is the only time that he has left before he is cast into the lake of fire to serve out his sentence for eternity. This day of salvation is the only time that he has left. And his primary goal is to destroy all the witnesses of Christ because we are the only ones who has the power to testify against him continuously and expose his vicious activities. Revelation 12, 9 through 11 describes what is occurring right now. Uh, verse 9 through 11. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation, strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brother is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they, that is the believers, overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. There's so much to unpack here, but it helps to explain why, like a lion, Satan has a specific diet. Satan's target for consumption is those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That testimony is that Jesus was dead, but now is alive forevermore. And Satan's goal is to give the believer hell while on earth, because once the day of salvation ends, we will see this mega demon no more. He will no longer be in the picture lurking in our night seasons because in our final retirement home, New Jerusalem, it will be daylight all of the time. Revelation 21 and 25, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There should be no night there. 22 and 5, there shall be no more night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever.
Listen, saints, our retirement home is a gated community and we will never get a light bill. Do what you have to do to stay in the light right now. Stay sober and stay alert because once the day of salvation ends, Satan will be taken over by an everlasting night cast into the lake of fire. Jesus calls it the outer darkness or a place that is so dark that it can only be described as outer darkness. But for you who stay in the light, when the day of salvation ends, you will be overtaken by an everlasting light. Oh, God, I thank God for Jesus. And the time is coming, saints. Lights out for the devil and lights on forever for you and I, the believer, those who have put their trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, saints, see God's big picture right now because you are in it front and center and the devil knows it. He knows that he can fight you, but the blood of the lamb and your testimony won't let him defeat you. Uh, oh, the weapons of death that he once had is now the weapon that works against him. Oh, God, to be absent from the body now is to be present with the Lord. Listen, to kill the save you is to place you in the full presence of your Lord. Oh, to kill the save you now means that God enjoys a precious moment because precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. No, the devil do not like you. In fact, he cannot stand you. And his hatred runs deep because God loves you. Now, his problem is with God, and he has a problem with you because God loves you. God demonstrated his love when Jesus died for you. God fortifies his love for you by placing a garden over your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's commitment and faithfulness to you is why the devil is against you. But all souls belong to God, who is love. God loves the world, but God is just. And since he is faithful and just and cannot deny himself, his justice won't allow him to not judge our sin. So instead, God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. So he is slow to wrath, but he is not slack concerning his promise. Saints, the day of salvation is coming to an end. All of the signs of the time suggest that this is that we are already late in the evening of the day of salvation and the sun is already going down on the devil. Very soon, the devil will lurk in the night and that will never end in the lake of fire. But see the big picture, saints. Matthew 24, Jesus confirms that it's going to get darker before it gets brighter. But look up. And lift up your head. The prophet Zechariah spoke about the dark closing days of history with hope for the children of the light. Zechariah 14, 6 through 7. And it shall come to pass on that day that there shall not be light. The bright ones shall withdraw themselves, but it shall be one day which is known in, unto Jehovah, not day and not night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time there shall be light. And our apostolic forefather picked it up and said it this way. It shall be light in the evening time. The path of glory you shall surely find. Through the waterway there is a light today. Bear it in his precious name. Young and old, repent of all your sins and the Holy Ghost will enter in. The evening time has come. It's a fact that God and Christ are one. Oh, saints, it's time to accept Jesus Christ, God's light, and stay in the light, even when it's too dark to see. All that we could ever need to stay holy and healthy is in Jesus. Colossians 2, 9 through 10, for in him dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of the church, which is the head of all principality and power. So as stated by Peter, he wrote this letter to a Gentile congregation, and they were saved out of their affluent culture. 
So the Gentile believers uh, receiving this letter were blindsided by the persecution that came upon them that they would face as Christians. Now, to be blindsided is to be unpleasantly surprised or be mentally hit or jolted unexpectedly. These Gentiles turned Christians were blindsided by the way they were now being treated by their non-Christian counterparts. And to this, Apostle Peter says, 1 Peter 4 and 12, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Saints, God is going to throw his weight around for you. Just hold on. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Somebody ought to praise him right now because the name is all on your life. As long as we are in our bodies of flesh, saints, we will be vulnerable to being spiritually jolted and or shook up by an unpleasant turn of events. Man that is born of a woman is only of a few days, Job said, and is full of trouble. Trouble is a part of the human experience, saved or unsaved, saint or sinner, believer or unbeliever, or non-believer. Trouble is going to come everybody's way. It's part of being a part of a fallen creation. But our trouble is also Satan's opportunity to take a shot at God by trying to undermine God's love for you so that he can steal you away from God and then kill you, kill your testimony and destroy your life. Not necessarily in death, but just to destroy your life that you are living for God so that others can see the destruction and wonder whether or not something is wrong with God. Oh, God, he waits for an opportunity when our flesh is too weak to notice him sneaking up on us in our pain and in our thoughts. When we are not alert with sober thoughts, the flesh will be tempted to question God's will as well as God's love for us. Like a lion, the devil seizes the opportunity with the suggestions of vain imaginations that are diabolical to the knowledge of God. Our painful experiences like grief and loss and constant sicknesses are some of the devil's best opportunities to attack our relationship with God. But we must commit to arresting every thought and bringing every thought captive to the word of God. But notice, saints, if suffering as a Christian can come as an unpleasant surprise that have us thinking that something is strange is happening, then at those moments, the believer is no longer alert and thinking soberly about what it means to be a Christian. So Apostle Peter goes on to instruct, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is like a roaring lion prowling around for his prey. So, I, But I want to give you four ways Satan is like a lion and why believers must stay sober and alert. Number one, like a lion, Satan is a predator and he knows his prey. And he studies their habits so that he can know the best way to sneak up on them. Satan knows his limitations, the word of God. So much is revealed by the demons who use a man to attack the sons of a Jewish priest uh, found in Acts 19, 14 through 16. Notice what it said. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the and the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus, I know and Paul, I know. But who are you? 
Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Oh, God, Jesus, we know. And Paul, we know. Two different words for know is used. Jesus, we know. Or Jesus, we conosco. In other words, we have an intimate and empirical knowledge of Jesus. We go back a long way. We knew him as angels before we became demons. We knew him as the word in eternity before he became flesh. Jesus, we conosco. Oh, God, with this an intimate, long-term relationship. Paul, we know, or Paul, we do, or the word means to have observational knowledge of him. We have watched and observed Paul, and we know that he is the real thing. But who are you? Oh, God, saints, like lions, the devil and his demons study you. They had studied the Apostle Paul. They had observed the Apostle Paul. And they go back a long way with Jesus. Listen, saints. Say, listen, saints. Demons and devils go back a long way. They know the history. They know the word. Like lions, the devil and his demons study you, their potential prey. This is why Satan was wrongly convinced that he could cause Job to curse God because he had studied Job and what was Job's greatest concerns. And Job eventually said when he was going through, found in Job 3 and 25, what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. No, the devil does not know your future, but your past he knows and your thoughts he is evaluating constantly. When he has the opportunity, he is going to attack you based upon your fears and what you dreaded the most. Oh, God. Apostle Paul said, this is why the Apostle Paul said we haven't been given the spirit of fear or a constant walking around in fear. Oh, God. Job lost his children and his possessions because he feared and dreaded the possibility of losing them. And Satan went right in when God gave him the opportunity because he knows the word of God and can quote it better than we can. Satan knows the word of God that says, first John 5, 15 and 16, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those who love the world don't love God, and the devil knows that they don't love God. And the devil don't love God. In fact, he hates God. So the devil is not coming or bothering those who are doing that which says that they do not love God and therefore already supports his agenda. In fact, he leaves them alone and lets them have free reign because then they remain an anonymous hater of the father. It doesn't matter how many robes they wear, how many times they stand in the pulpit, how big or how small the church may be, how much scripture they know. The devil knows that. Oh, God. But when someone does not love God based upon their obsession with the world, the devil knows it. They are anonymous haters of God. Notice the word of Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, watch this, for even Satan fashioned of himself into an angel of light. It is no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The devil is the master deceiver and false prophets are his co-workers and extremely dangerous because they are anonymous haters of the father. And it confuses people whenever they are finally exposed. And then people want to blame the church and blame Jesus and blame God. But they were already anonymous haters of God. Notice the words of Jesus found in Matthew 24 and 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
Lord, have mercy, and shall deceive many. Verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And there you have it, saints. Satan encourages false apostles, deceitful workers, to imitate apostles of Christ. Satan does the same thing, so they are working together with him. They are co-workers, co-laborers. Listen, don't be deceived, saints. Satan does not want to be an alcoholic. His goal is to imitate an apostolic, one sent by God, because then he can contaminate the message of truth. Peter tells the church to be sober, to be alert. Saints, be sober. Our enemy is too sneaky for us to be alcoholic apostolics, drunk on the world and therefore staggering and stumbling to accept the will of God, the word of God. When God says it, we need to say amen. Lord, have mercy. James refers to trying to love God and love the world at the same time as spiritual adultery. Lord, have mercy. James 4 and 4. Adulterous and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Oh, saints, I refuse to commit adultery. That's why I'm going to love God and not love the world. Oh, yes, there is adultery and then there is adultery. And many times people are not committing adultery, but they really are committing adultery because they are holding on, loving the world, even at the expense of their love for God. This is spiritual adultery. Oh, God, help us, Jesus. Oh, God, that's number one. The reason why it is important to be sober and be alert because the devil knows his prey and he studies them. Number two, the second reason why saints must stay sober and alert, because like lions, Satan is a master of the surprise attack. Lions are sneaky and quiet when they are on the prowl searching for prey to devour. Like a lion's prey, it's easy for a saint to be blindsided by the devil when life becomes overwhelming and stresses keep coming one after another. And like lions, the devil is sneaky and quiet. Listen, saints, if your tests, trials, twists, and turns of life events can sneak up on you and surprise you, so can the devil. Because like a lion, he is a master of surprises. It may be for a short period that a believer is questioning God's power to protect them and their faith and people's concern for them. But a momentary thought is all the devil needs to stomp on you because he has already been trying to sneak up on you. Even on your happiest days and moments, you are not even thinking about the devil. He never stops thinking about you and sneaking up on you. He is as close as any vain imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Because Satan knows the word of God and he knows when we are opposed to it in our minds. That's his opportunity to come in for the spiritual kill. Listen, saints, stay sober and stay alert. If there be any virtue in Christ, and there really is, then you must think accordingly. Think on these things. Think on things that are lovely. Think on things that are pure. Don't spend your time thinking about who likes you and who don't like you, who hates you and who don't hate you. Don't spend your time focusing on the world, what the world is doing, what people is doing. If there be any virtue in Christ, think on things that are lovely and pure. Oh, God, love, think of no evil. If you say you love God and love your neighbor, then you can't be sitting around thinking about evil and bad things about your neighbor. Oh, God, we all have those times when we are jolted by something and are not paying attention to our response, feelings and our thoughts. But you cannot be blindsided or try or sidetracked for a moment because the devil will sideline you before you know what hits you. Oh, the devil is already prowling around. So he is ready at a moment's notice to enter your mind with thoughts that are against God's love for you and your love for him. 
people who are blatantly opposed to the commands of God and are rationalizing what they are doing and running after the ways of the world while trying to be a Christian, the devil does not even bother them because they are already a part of his kingdom or very close to it. Oh, listen, saying the devil finds what's dear to you. And that's where he sneaks up on you. When Jesus had fasted and was hungry, Satan tempted him to turn a stone into bread. Oh, he didn't put a woman in front of him. Jesus was hungry. Oh, he didn't put material things in front of him. Jesus was hungry. Whatever you're dealing with, that's what the devil is going to come along and offer to you. When Jesus used scripture, the devil quoted, intentionally misquoted scripture, knowing that Jesus came to reclaim his world. Satan offered it to him without any resistance. He didn't know how God was going to do it, but he knew that the king was here to reclaim his property. So the third time Satan said, listen, all of this is mine. I'll give it to you if you just fall down and worship me. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Oh, God, Jesus didn't go into a dialogue with him about who owned what. Because Jesus knew that in the justice of God, Adam had forfeited everything to the devil and the devil was running things. And so when he told Jesus, I give it to you, he knew something was up because he knew that the word would not have been flesh unless God has something up because he knows God better than we do. So what he did to get ahead of God, he says, listen, let's just kind of work this out together. I'll give you all of this, but you got to fall down and worship me. Understand something, saying when you are close to God, when you have the power of the God inside of you, the devil is trying to get you to work together with him. Let's just work together. Listen, all you got to do is just look the other way, tip your head at sin, and I'll make sure that you have a lot of stuff going on with you. I'll make sure that everybody loves you. Everybody likes you. I'm telling you, saints, I got word that suggests if everybody loves you, you in trouble. If everybody likes you, you in trouble because that's what the enemy wants. He don't want you to cause him any trouble and he'll do anything possible. He'll allow you to get anything you want as long as you don't give him no trouble. All you got to do is fall down and worship me. You don't have to go through anything else. You don't have to go through no pain and trouble. He knows God like we do. He knows the word of God. He knew the prophecy. Oh God, there was something hidden from him. Oh God, if they knew what God was doing in crucifixion, he would have never allowed Jesus to be destroyed. But he didn't know that God was going to flip death on him. But oh God, he knew who Jesus was. He recognized him when he said, if you be the son of God, that means since you are the son of God, then do this and do that. Oh, God, all Jesus had to do was fall down and worship him. And Satan would have been in control just like he was with Adam. Satan is sneaky and quiet. No doubt Hollywood supports the devil's agenda. Satan does not mind being depicted as a red horn figure with a pitchfork. In fact, I would go as far to say the devil loves that. That's probably one of his best imitations of him. No doubt he enjoys that image because it is nothing like who he really is. Those who are looking for the devil to come this way are easy prey for the devil to devour. God says, I am that I am. I'll be whatever you need me to be when you need me to be. The devil's trying to imitate God. He's saying the same thing. Whatever you want, whatever the desires of your flesh is, if it's lust of the eyes, I'll show it to you. If it's lust of the flesh, I'll make you feel it and I'll make you feel good. If it's the pride of life, oh, I'll lift you up to the highest level. Whatever it is you want, I'll make sure that you have it. Don't be deceived, saying, oh, God, you're going to get and have everything that God promised you without the devil in your life. Oh God, that's the mistake that Adam made. The devil made it real clear to them that you will be like God. Listen, they were already like God. And don't be deceived, saints. You're going to get what God said that you would have the right way. And when you do it that way, oh, to God be the glory. Scripture is clear that Satan's best imitation is to imitate a preacher, not the predator that he is. Note the scripture, 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. 
It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Do you know how many people have walked out on church, walked out on God because they found out that somebody was playing in the pulpit and not being real in the pulpit? But the apostle Paul said, don't be surprised. That's where the devil wants to be. He wants to be an angel of light, a.k.a. messenger of light, because Satan knows the word. And he can confuse the word. He can put words in there, mix it up and make it look like something that is not. And if your flesh is running after that, that's what you're going to have. Don't blame God. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked when people who are jacked up confirm that they are jacked up. Oh, because Satan is on the loose, saints. Although he's been defeated, he's not depleted of being a devil. And he'll use anybody, including the mouth of a Peter, who is a disciple. Oh, God, Satan does not impersonate fire breathing dragons or is a two legged animal with a tail red with horns. But his preference is to masquerade as a well poised angel of light, a.k.a. preacher of the gospel. Satan is sneaky and quiet, not straightforward and loud. Oh, God, I thank you. What about Ephesians 6 and 11? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the travesty, the trickery, the methodia, or we get our word methods of the devil. The devil has a method to his madness, and it is being able to sneak up on his prey and devour them before they know what and how it happened. Oh, a believer is vulnerable when they are busy going through hurt and pain and cannot notice or pray or cannot notice or pay attention to how they are thinking and behaving. Oh, the devil seizes the opportunity to sneak up on in our thoughts, to make negative suggestions about our God. Also, when our believer is too exhausted to be alert and vigilant, to watch their blind spots, anxiety and a lack of sleep go together and they create spiritual blind spots. Mumbling and grumbling against the will of God creates blind spots when the devil is gaining an opportunity to devour the grumbler. Apostle Paul told the church at Philippi, pray always as well as rejoice always. The songwriter said it's hard to stumble when you're on your knees. And I will add it's hard to grumble when you have a praise and a prayer in your mouth. Somebody ought to praise God for being God. This brings me to the third important reason why believers must be alert and sober when it's suffering, whatever the reason. Number three, the third reason believers must stay alert and be sober minded to recognize the devil. Because like a lion, the devil's teeth of torture are strong and capable of sinking in with a strong grip. Because like a lion, once the devil has a prey in his jaws, the escape is nearly impossible. But he has to find that place of the weakness in the believer's flesh to latch on to them. Notice the words of Jesus, John 14 and 30 through 31. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me but that the world may know that I love the father. And as the father gave me commandment, so I do arise. Let us go from here. St. Jesus knew it was time to stop talking and relocate himself in a place where the will of God could continue because the ruler of the world, the prowling lion was coming. But Jesus was sober and alert and had not committed a single sin. So because the devil had nothing in Jesus that he could latch on to, Jesus defeated him all the way to the death of the cross. But notice, saints, Jesus is making an assertive effort to prepare himself for the attack by relocating himself 
in a place where the will of God could continue to be done. Stay sober and alert and follow the commandments of our Father. The word of God is the devil's limitation and those who obey it will not have anything in them that the devil can latch on to in order to destroy them. Jesus said, arise, let us go from here. Jesus was making a conscious decision to position himself in a place where the will of God could be carried out to its fullest extent. Listen to me, saints. Whether it's move, whether it's moving, finding a home, changing jobs, relocating your position, or making a financial decision, or whatever it might be, we must consciously position ourselves in places.